to begin with a genealogy of some definitions of hospitality and the stranger in two basic traditions, uh, the Indo-European and the Abrahamic, that could be said to comprise the main uh, influences on our Western notion of hospitality. Uh, in other seminars, I hasten to add, we will be looking at non-Western notions of hospitality. Uh, but given the particular limits of this evening, and my own particular limits and ac academic expertise, uh, I will be talking about the traditions that I know something about since I hear from them. Secondly, I want to say that hospitality is not going to be treated in the seminar tonight, and I think in most other seminars, as some kind of abstract virtue or concept or convention, but rather as a drama. As a drama with risks and wagers of what we're going to be calling the embodied imagination. And what we mean by that is that instead of treating the other as is often done in, in contemporary and indeed traditional philosophy, as a problem of other minds, as a metaphysical question of substances, mind-body problems, uh, cognitive science, and so on. Not that that's not a very important uh, mode of investigation, but what is perhaps specific to this seminar is the attempt to use embodied imagination and to investigate embodied imagination as a way of approaching and responding to the other. So there would be a particular focus on a pathos of hospitality, uh, which expresses the response of a self to a stranger, a sensible and carnal response that's pre-reflective and pre-conceptual, and that works through the five senses, and indeed, as we will also be exploring, a sixth sense. So on the basis of this embodied imagination, we will try to see how Hospitality involves a dual response. Uh, the mystics referred to the encounter with the stranger as fascinens et tremendum. On the one hand, it, 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 it attracts us uh, and bedazzles us. On the other hand, we recoil from it, tremendum, as Rilke signals when he says every angel is terrible. Uh, it's also a dual response in that hospitality involves both an active and a receptive openness to the other, and a certain active choice and commitment to the other. And finally, I want to suggest that embodied imagination is always, and invariably, a discerning imagination. That is that in all of the five senses, as they work through imagination, the olfactory imagination, the visual, the auditory, and so on, seeing is always a seeing as this or that, a seeing the stranger as hospitable or hostile, a hearing the stranger as hospitable or hostile, a touching the stranger as hospitable or hostile. And this, I would like to suggest, involves a sort of poetics of interpretation. I also want to suggest at the outset that there are two sort of models of hospitality in contemporary philosophy that may be useful as a guide to our readings this evening. On the one hand, there is a philosophy of conditional hospitality, which sees the relationship of self to stranger as relational. On the other hand, there is a model of unconditional or absolute hospitality, represented largely by Derrida. The first, I would suggest, is represented by Ricoeur and Hermeneutic. Uh, the second, by Derrida and the deconstructive uh, school. And here, we get a very different notion of hospitality as an openness to the radical other without preconditions. So let me say a few words about each of those before proceeding to a, genealog a brief uh, genealogical account of the Indo-European and Abrahamic uh, notions of hospitality. OK, the first then, relational hospitality, the first model, or conditional. I think this is well represented by Paul Ricoeur's uh, notion of linguistic hospitality, which he develops particularly towards the end, end of his life and in his last book, On Translation. He sees hospitality as a process of translation between most basically an author and a reader, but then in the, in the translation, translation process between a host language and a guest language. And this he then 
suggests is a paradigm for the relationship between self and stranger. I quote briefly from his last book on translation. Bringing the reader to the author, bringing the author to the reader, at the risk of serving and betraying two masters. This is to practice what I like to call linguistic hospitality. It is this which serves as a model for other forms of hospitality that I think resemble it. Confessions, religions, cultures, are they not like languages that are foreign to one another, with their lexicon, grammar, rhetoric, stylistics, which we must learn in order to make our way into them? And are, are not other forms of hospitality, ethical, political, cultural, not to be taken up with the same risks of translation and betrayal, but also with the same renunciation of the perfect translation. So I think what Ricoeur is suggesting here is that hospitality is a process of reciprocity, is a process of relationality between two different persons or languages, but it is not a fusion. It's not a confusion, but a respect in relation for the unique singularity and difference of host and stranger. The alternative model of hospitality, that is to say absolute, or what Derrida would call pure hospitality, dispenses with any conditions. The conditions of identity, who are you, who am I, as we enter into a relationship. Uh, the conditions of law, the conditions of contract, or of pact. He, he talks about conditional hospitality as always presupposing a xenos, a stranger, in a xenia, that is to say, in some kind of contractual community. And Derrida suggests, contrarywise, that absolute hospitality doesn't presuppose any preconditions, but is a, a total yes to the incoming other. A few quick uh, citations may be of help here. The first uh, brought to my attention by my colleague Kalpana Cheshadri, and indeed she will be going into this in more detail in three weeks' time in her presentation. Uh, I quote, it's from Derrida's book on hospitality. Let us say yes to who or what turns up before any determination or anticipation, whether or not it has to do with a foreigner, an immigrant, an invited guest, an unexpected visitor, whether or not the new arrival is the citizen of another country, a human, an animal, or divine creature, a living or dead thing, a male or a female. So the welcome to the other here, the yes to the other, is, is beyond questions of law, questions of inclusion and exclusion, who has a right to enter the sovereign state or the sovereign community, and who has not. Um, uh, this one, from again from um, hospitality, where he, he says that unconditional hospitality is always a break with everyday conventions of hospitality, governed by rights, contracts, and duties. And he argues, absolute hospitality requires that I open my home and that I give not only to the stranger furnished with a family name and a social status and identity, but to the absolute other, unknown and anonymous, and that I give place and let come and arrive, let this other take his place or her place in the place that I offer them, without demanding that they give their name or enter into some reciprocal pact. So no us, no them. Uh, no pure, no impure. This, Derrida concludes, ultimately means that the relationship of hospitality to the stranger is, is undecidable. We don't know who the stranger is. And if we do know and decide in advance what kind of a stranger it is, then we're not being hospitable. Or at least it's not pure hospitality. For pure hospitality or pure gift to occur, he says, there must be absolute surprise. That is, an opening without horizons of expectation to the newcomer, whoever that may be. And he goes further. The newcomer may be good or evil, but if you exclude the possibility that the newcomer is coming to destroy your house, if you want to control this and exclude this terrible possibility in advance, there is no hospitality. So, he concludes, like the Messiah, the stranger must arrive wherever he or she wants. Um, 
robustly put. And yet we may ask a question before we pass on. How does one discern or distinguish between different kinds of strangers if one felt, feels obliged or, or condemned to do so or compelled to do so? How do we tell the difference between Jesus and Jim Jones, both of whom heard words from the Father asking them to carry out certain missions and mandates? Or the difference between Siddhartha and the Marquis de Sade? Or the angel who commands death to Abraham, to kill his son? And the other angel who brings life and restores the son as a gift? These are questions, arguably, of interpretation and discernment, even discrimination. And I would like to bear these questions and these two models of hospitality in mind as we proceed. So then, two basic parts to the seminar this evening. On the one hand, a genealogy of terms and definitions uh, in the European, Indo-European uh, tradition. And I'll be relying pretty heavily here on uh, Benveniste's piece, the Indo-European Indo Society and Language, which you will all have received. It's pretty dense and technical, but it's very um, influential and seminal as, as a sort of a classic text outlining the different notions of stranger and guest and enemy uh, in terms of hospitality. And secondly, we look at the biblical Abrahamic traditions. So I'll start with the Indo-European. Uh, Benveniste makes the basic point that there's, there's a fundamental inaugural ambivalence in the two formative terms for stranger, the hostess and the hospes. And he says it's because of this fundamental ambivalence in both terms that hostility can become hospitality and hospitality can become hostility. In fact, Derrida's reading of this is that the Indo-European notion of hospitality should be called hospitality because it contains the two almost alternative views. Benveniste's basic claim is that the original sense of stranger as hostis, the Latin term, uh, expresses itself as guest, and always within some reciprocal pact. The related terms for this are therefore interesting. We have hostis, which means somebody with equal rights. The other that is given equal rights to those natives within the community. Other cognate terms are indicative, says Benveniste in this regard. For example, historium was an instrument for measuring equal measures of or quantities of grain and, and wheat and corn. Hostelina was an equal compensation for people doing different kinds of work. Hostia was a compensatory offering or sacrifice to the gods so as to receive in return and in recompense um, justice and benevolence. In all of these, there's a give and take. And in fact, the subtitle for the piece which was distributed to all is called Giving and Taking. It's not unique to the Indo-European, by the way. I just mentioned this in, 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 in parenthesis, although we don't have time to go into it. But for instance, the, the Native American uh, practice of potlatch, uh, so famously analyzed by Marcel Mauss, makes the point that the basis of, uh, of, this, of their civilization and, and society was also based on a give and, and take of gifts. So moving on to the development of hostess, originally as guest, uh, he says over time it develops into the notion of enemy, hostess as enemy, and hence our word hostility. I quote, the primitive notion conveyed by hostess is one who repays my gift with a counter gift. Thus, like its Gothic counterpart, gasts, Latin hostess at one period denoted the guest. The classical meaning enemy must have been developed when reciprocal relations between clans were succeeded by the exclusive relations of civitas, to civitas. So as one moves from the communal give and take 
uh, where there can be contracts and compacts uh, at a sort of a relational level to the abstract contractual state, uh, the, the hostess as guest becomes hostess as enemy because now the other is considered a threat to the sovereign state, which is one and indivisible, as uh, Rousseau tells us, and indeed Hobbes. Now, moving on to the second seminal term, hospes, uh, Benveniste remarks a similar ambivalence at work, though in a slightly different way, with a slightly different inflection. Here, hospes refers to both the host and the guest, and in this kind of interconvertible way. The host who receives or refuses to receive the stranger as guest is a hospes. And indeed, ultimately, the hospes develops both senses of both master and guest. In fact, guest master is, says Benvenis, probably the best translation for hospes. Now, he makes much of the fact that in the term hostepets, which is at the root of hospitality, there is that little monosyllable pet, which is related in turn to our Latin word pot, potestes, potest, meaning power or potency. And Benveni's basic point is that the, the master of the house, the hospes, is the one who has power over both the house, the economy of the house, but also over others who may be invited into the house. So it's basically a question of identity. The master has an identity precisely because the master is not the other, the guest, the stranger, who is invited in. And the master, as guest master, has a right and a power to include and to exclude. So one can have favorable strangers or hostile strangers, but it's the master of the house who, as hospes, decides this matter. To summarize Benvenist's rather complicated um, arguments, the positive sense of the hospitable host relates to one who receives and welcomes the guest as a foreigner or a stranger in some kind of reciprocal gesture. But this positive and original sense gradually fades out in the development of anonymous states and regimes, particularly in Indo-European Western society. Quote, final quote, one of the Indo-European expressions of this institution of hospitality as reciprocal obligation is precisely the Latin term hostis. In historical times, the custom had lost its force in the Roman world. It presupposed a type of relationship which was no longer compatible with the established regime. When an ancient society becomes a nation, a civitas, the relations between man and man, clan and clan, are abolished. All that persists is the distinction between what is inside and what is outside the civitas. Friend and enemy, us and them, gens and degens, the Greeks and the barbarians, the Romans and the Etruscans, the Aryans and the non-Aryans, the English and the Irish. In fact, the first, um, not to get too parochial about this, but the first use of the word gens to define the English nation in the Venerable Bede and subsequently was, all, was in opposition to the Dagens. And the Dagens were actually the Celts, the Irish, and the other island. And if, one, if there was any intermarriage, for example, in Dublin, the colonial English settlement, with anybody outside of the Pale, which was the palisade, the, 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 the wooden fence uh, surrounding Dublin, then they were degenerates. And of course, the gentry, the gentlemen, gentility all comes from this notion of gens. Uh, but the gens and the day gens was simply a convention. It didn't actually respond, as the etymology of the term suggests, gens genitus, genealogy, to some kind of natural um, distinction of, of ethnicity, race, or blood. That was the implication. It was, in fact, a form of uh, invented apartheid. But in whatever society you take, and most, I suppose, egregiously and ignominiously in, in recent history, Nazi Germany, dividing the world into Aryans and non-Aryans, for Benveniste, this is an example of 
the hostis as hostility, as abstract sovereign states develop, as, as um, ethnically exclusive nations develop, then I quote, the word hostis assumes a hostile flavor and henceforward it is only applied to the enemy. Now in, in, in some of our later seminars, we will be returning to the political implications of this question of hospitality and hostility as it relates to very contemporary topical uh, situations such as Iraq, uh, the Middle East, Palestine, Israel, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, and the Balkans, and indeed South Africa. We will have two seminars in, in March on these questions. So the wager of hospitality today, as it uh, relates to these very topical and burning issues and examples, is a question of how one turns aliens and strangers into guests. How one turns scapegoats into friends. That's the drama and that's the risk of hospitality. And the implications, I think, are radical and extensive. Before I leave the Indo-European genealogy, I want to take just two very brief examples um, of hospitality in, in sort of a cultural context. The Greek and the uh, Indian or Hindu. Firstly, the Greek. It's interesting that Zeus was known as Zeus Xenios, namely the protector of strangers. And he himself appeared as a stranger in disguise in many occasions, including in the famous encounter with Baucus and Philemon, who do not at first recognize him or Hermes as, they, as disguised as, as strangers. And the greatest crime uh, in Greek society was as uh, Zeus, at any rate, determined the offense against the stranger. And this ethic of hospitality is powerfully manifest uh, in, in, in Greek literature. In the Homeric Code of Philoxenia, uh, both in the Odyssey and the Iliad, one thinks, for example, of how the Phaeacians welcome Odysseus, how the Cyclops refuses to. In one case, an observance of the ethic of hospitality, in the other case, a breach, or how in the Iliad, the Homeric code of Xenia, or hospitality, is evidenced in the famous example of Glaucus and Diomedes, represented on this vase here. Uh, in the sixth book of the Iliad, Homer recounts how these enemies come together, but refuse to kill each other, when they acknowledge that they're bound by uh, a tie of hospitality. Here's the passage in question. You are for me a guest, Zynos, says Diomedes. I am your host in the heart of Argolid, and you are mine in Lichia. Let us avoid each other's javelin, and instead exchange our weapons so that everyone may know we are hereditary guests. And here you might say we have the origin in a way of the handshake. Instead of putting one's hand to the scabbard to draw, a shield, uh, to draw a sword and kill your enemy, you put your hand into the hand of the enemy. Uh, later again, the notion of hospitality returns in Greek society in a very formative way also in the Socratic code of hospitality to the stranger. This occurs in several of the dialogues, but just to mention one or two, you have the openness to the idiotic stranger in the Parmenides, to Gorgias, the eponymous Gorgias, in the um, dialogue of that name. And also in the Phaedrus, a kind of a dramatic decision that Socrates himself has to make when he follows the injunction, know thyself, and looking into himself sees two possibilities. He sees a stranger in himself, which terrifies him, Dinah. And he sees two aspects or two faces. On the one hand, two alternatives. On the one hand, the stranger in himself appears like Typhon, the, the destructive god from Tartarus with multiple heads 
um, and multiple swords coming from Hades. On the other hand, he sees his daimon. The other is what he calls the gentle and divine philosopher. But in both cases, he, he encounters a stranger and has the option to interpret that stranger, to see that stranger, to touch that stranger, to hear that stranger, to philosophize about that stranger, either as a monster, Typhon, or as a daimon. So there is the hostile and the hospitable, even in the Socratic response to the stranger. Uh, and of course, wonder is the beginning of philosophy. The wonder at this a terrifying but bedazzling strangeness, Dinos. Now, these are issues that are going to be returned to, uh, particularly in our May conference, uh, by a number of philosophers, John Salas, John Manisakis, um, John Caputo. So I leave them here for now. But I want to just mention one other example from Indo European society to take us a little bit towards the East. And that is the Indo example, sorry, the, um, yes, the Indo or Hindu uh, example uh, of the guest as Atiti. And this we find in um, a number of texts, it's the Sanskrit word which Benveniste also comments on, of which Kalpana will be, Tushadri will also be uh, discussing in her presentation in two weeks. And the, the guest as Atiti must be honored as a god, Atiti Divo Baba. Um, and this god, again as Kalpana has pointed out, is not manifested through the guest, but rather the guest, by being a guest, manifests the god. So it's not a question of ventriloquism. But the guest actually brings the divine into existence. And Bhava means coming into being. I quote Benveniste, Atiti guest has as its correlate Atiti Pati, the one who receives. So the guest calls the host, and the host calls the guest. And indeed, the Hindu god uh, of um, hospitality, the Indo-Iranian deity, Iraman, uh, presided over marriages and hospitable exchanges. As as related already in the Reg Gita, the very beginning, one might say, of the European society. But again, these notions of uh, these uh, in Indo uh, and Hindu and Sanskrit notions of hospitality would be revisited not only, as I say, in Kalpana's presentation, but also in the uh, conference on interreligious hospitality on the 14th of March, where we will actually have. Um, Hindu experts, uh, Frank Clooney from Harvard and Swami Tigananda from the Vedanta Center, who will be rehearsing some of these key notions. I want to move on now to the second part of the seminar. Uh, that is the Abrahamic tradition. Having said those few introductory remarks about the Indo-European and as I do so, I want to say something about imagination here. Because the three examples I'm taking, the three primary scenes of hospitality to the stranger, represented here behind us, the Judaic, Abraham welcoming the strangers, the Christian, Mary welcoming the stranger, and the Islamic, Muhammad welcoming the stranger in the cave at Medina. These are arguably instances of what Al-Arabi, the famous Islamic philosopher and mystic, called the imaginal. The imaginal, as he understood it in his book of Theophanies, was an invisible meaning becoming visible to us in the form of an appearance, surah. And this works, according to Al-Arabi, through imagination. We can only see it through the embodied imagination. And it's a bridge as such between the spiritual and the corporeal world. I quote, revelation begins with imagination, says al -Arabi. The angel imaginalizes itself as a man or as a person who is perceived. The angel casts the words of the Lord in the prophet's hearing, and this is revelation. So in other words, if we have no embodied imagination, we cannot open our eyes and ears and other senses to the stranger who comes. 
indeed, he has a beautiful verse, Al-Arabi, where he says, it's the stranger speaking. Dearly beloved, I've called you so often and you have not heard me. I've shown myself to you so often and you have not seen me. I've made myself fragrant so often and you have not smelled me. Savorous food and you have not tasted me. Why can you not reach me through the things you touch or breathe me through sweet perfumes? Why do you not see me? Why do you not hear me? Why, why, why? So in this instance, in Al-Arabi's verse, it is the divine stranger who is asking to be received and hosted and welcomed through the embodied imagination and the five senses. My wager then is that in the three inaugural scenes, imaginal scenes of the three Abrahamic religions, there is a poetics of the stranger at work. And the poetics of the stranger in turn entails and calls for a hermeneutics of the stranger. Hermeneutics is coming from the Greek term hermenoin to interpret. Okay, let me take each of the Abrahamic primary scenes in turn. I start with the Judea. It's a dry, hot day in the desert of Mamre. An old man is sitting at the door of his tent, pitched under the shade of an oak tree. His wife, Sarah, is inside the tent, sheltering from the midday sun. She's not happy. She is over a hundred years and she is barren. Her servant woman, Hagar, is younger and more attractive than she and more fertile. She's a rival. Abraham is brooding about his unhappy wife, about the future of Israel, when suddenly a shadow flits across the sunlit ground in front of him. He looks up to see strange men standing before him, and he is filled with fear. Why have they come, he wonders? To kill me? To kill us? There are three of them, strangers, and he has two women to protect, his wife and a servant girl. Should he kill the stranger? But instead of reaching for a weapon or retreating to his tent, Abraham finds himself running towards the visitors. He greets them, bows to the ground, and invites them to a meal. He asks Sarah to knead three measures of her best flour to make loaves, while he fetches a calf and prepares it with curds and milk. Then Abraham stands under the oak tree and watches the stranger eat. When they have finished, they announce that they will return in a year, and when they do, Sarah will be with child. Sarah, standing inside the entrance of the tent, laughs when she hears this, for it's quite impossible that she be with child. But the stranger repeats the promise, nothing is impossible to Yahweh. I shall come back to you at the same time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now that's a kind of a liberal gloss on Genesis 18, but I'm sure you get the picture. What's interesting here is, as the New Jerusalem Bible indicates, that while the strangers come initially as three, they end up as one, Yahweh, the divine, once they receive hospitality. So hospitality enables the strangers to manifest the divine, arguably to become the divine. It enables the impossible to become possible, enmity to turn into hospitality. The impossible to become possible in the sense that Isaac will be born to a woman who cannot bear him. And of course, the name Isaac itself means in Hebrew, one who laughs. And Sarah laughs at the impossibility, at the contradiction of an infertile woman suddenly being the bringer of Natal. Now, Abraham himself, of course, is arguably the wanderer par excellence. Maybe he learns this from the three strangers, one might say. He's the nomadic tent dweller. The Aramean celebrated in Psalm 119, I'm a stranger on this earth. Or as Hegel put it, not meaning it as a compliment, Abraham is a stranger on earth to soil and then alight. And indeed, the Jewish festival, the annual Jewish festival of Sukkot is a reminder to the Jewish people that they were tent dwellers. In fact, there's sort of a symbolic uh, erecting of a tent, even within houses and gardens, to remind uh, the people of Israel that they were once strangers on the earth. But if Abraham is a prophet of strangeness, he's also the first to experience the temptation of 
enclosure of hostility. That is, to fold his tent and build a fortress. And so while he welcomes the three strange men, Anashim, they're men, they're not angels, as in the Chagall painting, but they become, as it were, angelic once hostility turns into hospitality. If Abraham is capable of this extraordinary hospitality in overcoming his initial fear before the terrible angels, the terrible strangers, he's also capable of the cruelest acts. For he too uh, can do extremely inhuman things. He expels his foreign slave girl, Hagar, into the wilderness with their son Ishmael. So if Isaac is received in hospitality, Ishmael is, is banished in hostility. And one could say that on Mount Moriah, Abraham is faced with a similar response of hostility and hospitality to the voice of the stranger. One he interprets as a command to kill his son Isaac. Another as a command to save his son Isaac, to receive his son Isaac, as it were, back as a gift, as Kierkegaard puts it in Fear and Trembling. But he's capable of both. And happily, he made the right choice. But it's a drama. It's a risk. It's not a foregone conclusion. Elsewhere in the Jewish Bible, the, the Torah, one finds similar examples of very holy men and prophets, figures, being capable of both hostility and hospitality. Saul, for example, goes out to kill the Amalekites, but ends up dispensing mercy. J Jacob wrestles with the dark, anonymous someone, Ish, through the night, fights with him as a threatening adversary, as a terrible angel, until he finally opens himself to this other, welcomes the other, and discovers that it's the face of God. Peniel, the name of that place, is called after. The face of God. The next day, he is reconciled with his estranged rival brother, Esau. Levinas is an interesting gloss on this when he says, the epiphany of the face craft face opens humanity. The face in its nakedness as a face presents to me the destitution of the poor one and the stranger. And indeed, this Levinasian interpretation of hospitality is going to be developed in, in some detail by Jeff Blocko in his seminar in, in three weeks' time. Uh, one or two more brief examples. In the Passover, for instance, the Feast of the Passover, uh, one is reminded that one was a stranger once and therefore should always be welcoming to strangers that are not part of one's people or nation. You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of the stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. Exodus 22. And it's uh, I think interesting to recall that, the, that three of the earliest books of the Bible uh, are about strangers. Job, Ruth, who was a Moabite, an alien accepted by Boaz into the community, and of course the Song of Songs, where the Sholemite woman is dark but beautiful. She comes from elsewhere. And while resisted by the sentinels of the tribe, of the city, uh, Solomon, receives her. So the lesson seems to be that loving your other is more divine than loving yourself, or indeed your own. And that's pr probably why the Hebrew Bible has 36 commands to love the stranger, and only two to love your neighbor. Now Deuteronomy is the text par excellence of and on the stranger. The term used in Deuteronomy is ger. Deuteronomy 10, he shows his love for the stranger by giving him food and clothing. And this is translated, this term ger, the Hebrew term is translated into xenos in Greek, and xenophilia and xenophobia are our own English words, and peregrinus in Latin, hence peregrination. So here are just a few sample citations, and there are over 30 such in Deuteronomy. Cursed is he who distorts the justice due to a stranger, orphan, and widow. You shall not pervert the justice due to a stranger, 
or orphan, nor take a widow's garment in pledge. You shall rejoice the Lord your God and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are in your midst, etc. Now, there are a number of points, I think, that can be made about these uh, Deuteronomy citations. The first is that the stranger is always associated with the name of God. The second is that the stranger is linked with orphans and widows, therefore the most vulnerable and defenseless of beings without family or guarantor. Thirdly, the advent of the stranger calls for a justice that seems to go beyond the normal conventions of home and homeland and homeland security and accept those figures who would normally be excluded. Fourthly, the very fact that the Lord must repeatedly enjoin justice to prevent hatred of the foreigner suggests that the initial response, the natural response, the native response, is one of fear and hostility. And there are actually many exhortations within Deuteronomy itself. It is an ambivalent text. To smite the enemy and kill the foreigner in the infamous Melchimeth Mitzvah. So you've got both hostility and hospitality uh, contained within the Deuteronomy text. The term for Ger, the terms at least as translated for Ger, are very interesting. That it's translated into Latin in, term, in the following two terms. One, advina, advinus, the other, peregrinus. And the first suggests, as in our word, Advent or adventurous, somebody coming from beyond, from the future, from the radical outside. Whereas peregrinus suggests, as in English, peregrination, the one who wanders across borders and boundaries, who is not limited to um, the actual frontiers of a nation or a state or indeed a tribe. So the stranger is what comes by surprise, what does not come naturally to us. And our response is not naturally a hospitable one, a hospitable one, but rather a hostile one, which then needs to be overcome and requires imagination and trust for us to see the guest in the ostensibly threatening adversary. So what I'm suggesting really is that Already in the Abrahamic story, in its various guises and aspects, there is a fundamental paradox. As we approach the other, the stranger, the alien, do we react with compassion, predicated upon imagination, or murder? Do we welcome or refuse the stranger? This is a radical hermeneutic wager, and one could argue that monotheism is the history of this way. Moving on, secondly, now to the Christian wager, we find a similar double legacy at work, in the sense that for every Francis of Assisi, there's an inquisitor, and for every St. James, there's a Jim Jones, and for every Annunciation, there's a crusade or an inquisition. So I want to look at first, at the primary scene, I would argue, of Christianity, the Annunciation, where we find a, an exemplary sense of the hospitable. Not that this tradition was always observed in the history of Christianity, as the anti-God squad never tire of reminding us these days with their best-selling <laughs> critiques, and very clever they are too, um, by Christopher Hitchens and um, Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris, and I'm forgetting some of the other ones, but Dawkins, how could I forget him? Uh, who look only at the hostility in Christianity. It's a poison, it's a contamination, it's, it's a religion of fear and oppression. But I'm arguing if hostility does exist as part of the Christian tradition, there is another uh, tradition of hospitality which arguably is much more faithful to the primary scene. Scene. So, the Annunciation. Do you have the Botticelli version just above me? Just above me. A young Nazarene woman meets an intruder. 
She's alone in her shuttered room. She's reading. The day is cool. In the air, there is a fragrance of lilies. She is perhaps half thinking of her betrothed, Joseph, as she reads the Song of Songs, or perhaps the story of Rachel meeting Jacob at the well, or the story of Sarah being with child. We don't know because the Gospels do not say. We only have paintings and poems. She hears a flutter of wings and puts down her book, half closes her eyes and listens. Suddenly, out of nowhere, someone appears. He is terrifying in aspect, and Mary is full of fear. She withdraws, she steps back, she pauses, and then bowing her head and attending carefully to a voice that whispers, do not be afraid, Mary opens herself to the stranger and conceives a child. In short, Mary chooses grace over fear. She responds to the call and trusts in the promise. She dares imagine the impossible as possible. She says, yes, amen, a Nazarene echo of Sarah's laughter. Now, there are many artists, poets, and painters, as you know, who have responded imaginatively to this scene and exemplify the poet poetics of an interpretation that I have been um, invoking rather than uh, orthodox theology, although both have fascinating things to say. But let me just run through a few poems that illustrate this poetics of interpretation, which I think focuses on the hospitality in this primary scene. I start with a poem called Annunciation by Denise Levertov. The last stanza reads as follows. We know the scene, the room variously furnished, always almost a lectern, a book, always the tall lily. Arrived on solemn grandeur of great wings, the angelic ambassador, standing or hovering, whom she acknowledges a guest. But we're told of meek obedience. No one mentions courage. The engendering spirit did not enter her without consent. God waited. She was free to accept or to refuse. Choice integral to humanness. In other words, a wager. She looks up from her lectern and reads the face of the stranger and says, yes, carnally and courageously. After a moment of fear, there is the moment of welcome, the imaginative leap, the word of trust, and the word becomes flesh. Another poet, Andrew Hudgens, glosses Botticelli's Sestello painting of the Annunciation, which we have up above us, um, adding a further variation on this scene. Angel to virgin, both her hands held up, both elegant, one raised as if to say stop, while the other hand, the right one, reaches towards his. And as it does, it parts her blue robe and reveals the concealed red of her inner garment to the red tiles of the floor and the red folds of the angel's robe. But her whole body pulls away. Only her head, already haloed, bows, acquiescing. And though she will, she's not yet said, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. As Botticelli, in his great pity, lets her refuse, accept, refuse, and think again. So again, the drama. The drama of hospitality. And the, the Greek translation here is very interesting, the Greek rendition here is very interesting, because we're told that Mary is troubled when she first encounters the stranger, and ponders. She is troubled and ponders. And the two terms as I say, we're reading. Uh, Eteracte, the Greek for trouble, can be either being troubled by something monstrous and fearful, phobos is the word used, or else it can be a sort of a, a wonderment before epiphanes, something wondrous that appears. But the word contains both possibilities. And the very same term is used in the Annunciation to Zachariah of the birth of John the Baptist, in the Annunciation 
to Manoah's wife of the birth of Samson, translated in the Septuagint again as Eteracte. And the second term, I think, is also significant. She was troubled, Eteracte, and pondered. Because here we have the poetics of interpretation, as it were. The word used in Greek is dialogue isomai, dialogue isomai, which suggests, as in our word dialogue, that she is in relation to the other. She is dialoguing with herself and with the other. It is not violation. It is not divine rape. She can refuse or accept, refuse or think again. The theme of the stranger re returns again in a, in a very formative and influential way, I think, in the epiphany of the strangers, the three strangers, the Magi, the wise men who come from afar, from the east, to worship the child. And the child is a stranger to the earth, in a way hosted by them with their gifts. Just as the child, Mary's child, conceived in this moment of dramatic welcome, in turn, this child welcomes the three wise kings. So you've got a sort of a convertibility of guests and hosts. The foreign entering into the familiar and being welcomed as such. This is a theme later taken up by Andrei Rublev in his wonderful icon of the Trinity, uh, painted in 1411, and is invoked by Greek Orthodoxy, uh, Greek Orthodox Christianity, as one of the classic representations of the Trinity. Of course, the Trinity is represented uh, in terms of three angels. Uh, seated around a chalice or a cup. And arguably, these three angels uh, are refigurations in some way of the three wise men and, of course, the three angels of, uh, that appear to, to, to Abraham. And they represent the Trinity as a circle around this Korah, this, this cup, which is, in a way, a bowl of hospitality that is linked in, in many other uh, Greek Oriental representations of Mary and Jesus as a Kora Akoraton. In many of the mosaics and icons, you have this idea of Mary with the child Jesus in her womb and the Kora as the Kora Akoraton, the container of the uncontainable. And in this sense, one could see the Kora at the center of Andrei Rublev's painting of the Trinity as an aperture without which, as in all human openings to the stranger, the sacred could not be embodied. So Korah as a site of hospitality, um, both in the Abrahamic angels and the three persons of the Trinity, which are so beautifully brought together in Rublev, Rublev's icon. Looking briefly at the life of Jesus, it's interesting how estranging and strange he appears to his disciples. Uh, even his family say he's gone off his head. And on Mount Tabor, as in the Inn of Emmaus, he has to tell the disciples not to be afraid. He has to repeat the word of the angel. Uh, and indeed, of all angels in theophanies, in the three Abrahamic traditions, do not be afraid, because the initial reaction is one of terror. Rembrandt has a, a beautiful portrait. I'm sorry we didn't get both the Rublev and the Rembrandt up on the uh, screen for you uh, today. But he has a, a beautiful series of portraits on the Emmaus painting. And the one painted in 1628 shows Jesus uh, in, in, in silhouette. It's, it's a black, dark Jesus with no features, but irradiating this extraordinary epiphanic light. And the disciples in the inn are at once recoiling from the dark stranger that they can't make any sense of, they can't recognize. It's uh, featureless and, and, and faceless, but is coming into light and will soon be recognized as he breaks bread, the act of hospitality. So returning from the dead and appearing as <coughs> virtually dead, certainly uh, as a departed one incognito, it is only in the act of hospitality, once again, après coup, that uh, the stranger is recognized as divine. 
Uh, Michel de Certo has a, has a beautiful reflection on this, Christ as the other voice forever irrecoverable, uh, the, the person of radical estrangement. Um, but that's going to be commented on, I think, by uh, Fanny Howe, uh, our, our poet in residence here in the seminar, in her presentation on Michel de Certo uh, next month. Um, it's telling, I think, that in the office of the Greek Orthodox Matins of Good Friday, there is a story of Joseph of Arimathea who seeks the body of Jesus from Pilate. And in this text, which I don't have time to go into, the, the, the play on stranger, guest, host, estrangement, hospitality is quite extraordinary. I'll, I'll just briefly quote one passage and then alert you to the words used. Not that I want to get too terminological or linguistic about this, but it runs as follows, the last verse. Joseph came before Pilate, beseeching him, saying, give me this stranger who from infancy guested in the world as a stranger. Give me this stranger at the sight of whose strange death I am estranged. Give me the stranger who gave hospitality to the poor and the stranger. Now the terms for stranger is xenon, guested, xenesthenta, uh, estranged, xenothenta, and hospitality, xenidna. So you can see the play on the root xenon throughout that passage. And that wonderful paradox of the divine stranger as both host and guest. The one who gives, this is the one in, in this citation, who gives hospitality to the thirsting stranger, the hospice, and the one who calls to us to host him in turn as a guest. Joseph does by receiving and caring for his scarred body. So Jesus is the one who both gives and receives hospitality as host and as guest. This uh, kind of double play uh, on host and guest is also captured in um, the Adore Te Devote chant uh, celebrated on Monday, Thursday, <laughs> Monday, Thursday hymn, which concludes with this double image of Christ as both the one who offers the Eucharistic bread and the one who is received by us, or by communicants, as the bread is consumed. Lord, make known to us your presence at this table blessed. Stay with us forever, God, our host and guest. So let me conclude with what is arguably one of the most decisive passages on Christ the Stranger. I refer to Matthew 24, where the term stranger appears four times. It runs a part of it as follows. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Hospice. And then, of course, they say, well, when did we see he was a stranger? And da, 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 da. Um, for they had not recognized the divine embodied in the alien before them. But Jesus, by identifying explicitly, and in four different mentions of the word hospes, as the stranger makes the point that hospitality is arguably the vocation of the Abrahamic. So there's a choice to welcome or repudiate the stranger in Christianity as in Judaism. And I think it's not surprising when Jesus is asked in another episode in Luke 10 by the lawyer, who is my neighbor, that he replies with the story of the Good Samaritan, a stranger or in the decisive moment when he wants to reveal that religion should not be just a matter of ritual worship in, in temples and so on, but something worshipped in spirit, it is in an exchange with the Samaritan woman at the well that this takes place. And the only leper who comes back to say thanks when cured is the Samaritan. A logic. The text is, Jesus speaking, has none but this foreigner returned to give thanks to God. In terms of the monastic Christian tradition, and I'll end with this, one finds in St. Benedict's rule that was extremely influential in the development of Western monasticism. In chapter 53, this very unambiguous confirmation and celebration of the role of hospitality. I cite from chapter 53, this was written in the 6th century. 
left in it. Let all guests who arrive be received like Christ, for he is going to say, I came as a guest and you received me. And to let all due honor be shown, especially to pilgrims, in the salutation of all guests, whether arriving or departing, let all humility be shown. Let the head be bowed or the whole body prostrated on the ground in adoration of Christ the stranger, who indeed is received in their presence. So theology is anthropology. And indeed, uh, the abbot is, is, is uh, enjoined to wash the feet of all guests, regardless of where they come from. So the Benedictine legacy is one expression and articulation of Christian hospitality. The Crusades and the Inquisitions and bloody religious wars are arguably a refutation and betrayal of that pedigree. And the choice for Christians is obviously as contemporary as it is historical. Note Northern Ireland and the Balkans. Moving on then finally to Islam, <coughs> particularly relevant as we speak and in this world, uh, where very often Islam is prejudicially treated as hostile rather than hospitable. So in the remaining few minutes, I'd like to conclude with some remarks on Islam. It will be taken up again in our March conference uh, with uh, Jim Morris and some other experts in Islam. The primary scene of Islam. Third, uh, third on top. Of course, Muhammad is flanked because one doesn't want to become too iconic. And the stranger is represented in the multiple faces of Gabriel uh, on the top part of the painting. Primary scene. A respected businessman called Muhammad retires to a cave on the summit of Mount Hira. It's the month of Ramadan, 610. Here, as was his annual wont, Muhammad sets to praying, fasting, and providing alms to the poor and outcast members of Meccan society who visited him. This time, however, on the night of the 17th Ramadan, something extraordinary happens. Muhammad is woken from his sleep by a strange presence in the cave. Something grips him until he can hardly breathe. All his certainties desert him, dissolving into the walls of the cave. His entire body is convulsed, and he sweats profusely in the cool of midnight. Muhammad struggles, fearing his life may be in peril. Then suddenly he stops and listens. Muhammad decides to trust the incoming presence, and no sooner has he overcome terror and surrendered Islam to the stranger before him than he hears a voice speak through him. It's the voice of the angel Gabriel. Muhammad parts his lips, and the first words of a new Arab scripture issue from his mouth, the Quran. The prophet of Islam is born, discovering himself a foreigner within his own mother tongue. When I heard the Quran, he announced later, my heart was softened, and I wept, and Islam entered me. Muhammad didn't speak for a long time after this trauma, and he never wrote anything down. Hard to believe in the way certain non-representative uh, fundamentalists invoke the Quran. And he says, when he speaks finally to his wife and cousin, and then once later to some friends. Uh, but he says, talking about the revelation in the cave, that his soul was torn from him. Sort of a, an original, an aboriginal traumatism, what Levinas calls in traumatism original, which Levinas doesn't just confine to epiphanic moments of encountering the stranger, but what we all experience when encountering the stranger. The message of Islam is one of, I quote Muhammad, respecting the weak and the vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. <coughs> and the prophet also says, explicitly talking about the stranger, Islam began as a stranger, and it will become a stranger. So blessed are those who are strangers. And the term, the Islamic term here is, the Arabic term is garib, which as Jim Morris, our resident Islamic scholar in theology, 
for me means an outsider who is beyond the tribal ties and determinations of the community. So again and again, throughout the Quran and the Hadith, one finds precepts about hospitality to, to the other and to other nations. For example, the Quran 49, we've made you into nations and tribes so that you can get to know and befriend each other. Hardly a recipe for war or conquest. And Muhammad's injunction that one not try to interpret the Quran in any absolute way, because that alone can be interpreted by God, is itself a warning and a caution against dogmatism of any kind. Now, this positive legacy of hospitality, of Islamic hospitality, is one which a number of contemporary scholars have been um, articulating uh, in, in, in contemporary debates. Uh, Mahmoud Siraj, Abdul Karim Soroush, the 138 leading Islamic scholars in their text, A Common Word, in response to Benedict in October 2007, who called for a dialogue. Uh, hospitable dialogue between Christians and Muslims. Um, and also non-Islamic sort of Western scholars such as Henri Corbin and Hannah Merriman and others have been very much uh, drawing on this positive le legacy of Islamic hospitality. Let me just mention three sort of historical events or periods where this was very much in evidence. In the 12th century, one could cite the Andalusian philosophers, uh, Al-Farabi and the Beraways, who both argued for a radical debate between Islam and what they call paganism, which is basically Greek thinking and culture. And uh, Averroes, in his famous book of differences, as it was called the Fasal, uh, talks about Islam and Greek philosophy as milk sisters, absolutely indispensable to each other if truth is to be known. Um, so, during this period, and including figures like Baruni and Ghazali, one finds a sort of a golden age of interconfessional hospitality. Not that all the clerics took this on board, but it was advocated by these key philosophers and leading figures. In the 15th century, one could cite the Council of Florence, where leading Mufti and Islamic thinkers and representatives came from Constantinople to Florence. Uh, to try and bring about a reconciliation between Islam and Christianity. The Christian delegation was chaired and led by Nicholas of Cusa. Uh, but alas, uh, it came, to, it came to, to nothing historically. But it was a very important movement. And then thirdly, I'd like to mention another golden age uh, in Indian uh, Islam in the 16th century, 1617, under the Mughal uh, emperors, Babur and Akbar. There were some kind of nasty guys as well, but these were, these were good, hospitable figures who sponsored the translation of the main Hindu texts, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and the Upanishads into Persian, and actually convened, and this itself being a radical act of linguistic hospitality, and then convened a series of multi-faith symposia in uh, the palace, uh, Akbar's palace in Agra, where he brought together representatives of the different uh, religions in the Indian subcontinent. There were Brahmins, Sheikhs, uh, Christian Portuguese missionaries from Goa, Zoroastrian representatives from Gujarat, and so on. And at the very time, in 1600, when Akbar was actually conducting this interreligious uh, debate, hoping that one could develop an interspiritual philosophy, which he called Din e Alai. In that very year, we might recall Giordano Bruno was burnt alive in the Campo dei Fiori for his interreligious imagination. So one sometimes you know, thinks that the West is always on the side of hospitality, and the pagan East as somehow representing its alternative. But it's important, I think, to address the balance and reread the history, as so many contemporary scholars have done. I end with two examples from Islamic poets on the question of hospitality. The first, Hafiz, and the second, 
Das Kabir, both Islamic mystics, who very much um, exemplified uh, Arabi's, Ibn Arabi's notion of the imagination, the creative imagination which responds from the heart, al kalb, to the incoming stranger, who, if one responds hospitably to this stranger, is manifest as ishan, as beauty, as divine beauty. So a word briefly on it. Hafiz of Shiraz was a 14th century poet who wrote in Persian and who, like Kabir, talked of God as an uninvited guest. He believed that the heart, the kalb, was the locus, the imaginative locus of the encounter with the beloved guest. And he addresses, in one of his ghazals, his readers thus. If God invited you to a party and said, everyone in the ballroom tonight will be my special guest, how would you treat them when you arrive? End of quote. In other words, if we are all God's guests on this earth, how should we behave towards each other, and how do we know who is our host? God's guest of his is the beloved host of hosts, who teaches us hospitality by coming to us in the guise of the guest, inviting us to host him or her in turn as would a lover. And he deploys this language of theoerotics, where God is the lover and we are the beloved, or vice versa. Meeting with a stranger, Hafiz argues we shouldn't ask for their history or their allegiance or their identity. We should simply say, oh my dear, my beloved, be a stranger and ask no comrade's story. So in Hafiz's poem, and Ghazal. Again and again, it's as if God has invited many different people to celebrate in his house and asks us as follows to respect them no matter how strange their games. And their games are games of love. And yet in love, how do we know that the lover is divine or human, is a friend or a trickster, is to be trusted or not? There's always a wager, there's always a risk, there's always a drama. Hafiz says of God, he is a voyaging friend who comes and goes, calling and courting his creatures. God has made love with you and the whole universe is germinating inside your belly. Embodied imagination par excellence. So in this play of theoretic hospitality, gods, the God, the divine and humans, endlessly the beloved and the beloved and the lover, endlessly exchange the roles of guest and stranger. The sacred and the profane rub shoulders and drink from the same cup. But there's always a question when the stranger comes of turning initial hostility and fear to hospitality. Finally, Kabir Das, a 15th century visionary raised in Islam in northern India, who grew up to embrace both faiths, Muslim and Hindu, uh, in a sense, you could see him as an anticipatory prophet of what now is called dual religious belonging. And he invoked Allah and Rama, the Islamic and the Hindu gods, as his fathers. I am a hybrid child, well, he doesn't say hybrid. I am a child of Allah and Rama. And there is one thing in the world that satisfied, satisfies. There is one thing in the world that satisfies, and only one, and that is meeting with the guests in our everyday meeting. He has a beautiful poem where he says at the end, when you leave off your clothes and kill your senses, you do not please the Lord. The man who is kind and practices hospitality, who considers all creatures on earth as his own self, this is the one who attains immortal being. When Kabir died, Hindu and Muslim extremist sects fought over his body in order to appropriate it for their rival funeral rites. And legend has it that when they finally got to the shroud and lifted it, there was no corpse, but only a bed of jasmine. So to summarize my argument, or my hypothesis rather, in this introductory seminar tonight, tried to bring various strands 
definitions together. I would say that the hypothesis I've wagered here is that the three Abrahamic religions testify to a basic alternative in our response to the stranger. We either murder the stranger, or we overcome our fear and welcome the stranger. We respond with hostility or hospitality. Western culture, I'm suggesting, combining as it does both the Indo-European and the Abrahamic traditions that we briefly looked at tonight. Western culture, as such, is the history of this wager of hospitality. And our seminars will, I hope, uh, explore in different ways, in different interdisciplinary ways, the radical implications and consequences of this ongoing. So thank you for your attention, and now we have, I think, about 30 minutes for question and answer.